Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Et Good morning, one all. Welcome. I'm here uh, in person and online. It's really good to be back uh, with you here today at Queen's Park. I want to first acknowledge that this land is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. So I'm here today to report on my office's work over the past fiscal year. And when I say to my office, I'm referring to the terrific team without whose passion and skills these results would not be possible. I am, of course, well aware that this is the first week of a brand new legislative session and that we are only a couple of months away from municipal and school board elections. Now, we usually release our annual report in June, but the provincial election necessitated a change in timing, so we planned for August, not knowing that the members would be returning to the Assembly this month. In that context, I'd like to offer a reminder about the nature of my role in the work of this office. We are independent of government, apolitical, and nonpartisan. We do not get involved in the political process or political decisions. We oversee government administration and the delivery of provincial and municipal government services to ensure that they're fair to everyone and working as they should. As noted in today's reports, uh, report, complaints and inquiries to my office are actually trending upwards. They are almost back to pre-pandemic levels as more and more public services rebound from the impact of shutdowns and emergencies. We see that as good news because the more we hear from Ontarians, the more we are able to help them resolve their issues and to identify larger systemic problems. Je veux souligner qu'un hausse... I'd, I'd like to say that an increase in the number of complaints is a good news. The more we hear from Ontarians, the more we are able to help them resolve their issues and identify larger systemic problems. ...of how we can help with administrative problems, big and small. It shows how my office is uniquely positioned to assist all stakeholders, from citizens to provincial ministries and public sector bodies to elected officials. Our mandate now includes so much more than the provincial government agencies, which was already a very broad jurisdiction. The expansions of our mandate in 2016 and again in 2019 were very challenging for us as an organization. For example, amalgamating three separate organizations, each with distinctive mandates, stakeholder groups, and even three collective agreements into a single organization while working remotely in the midst of a pandemic has been a complex exercise, to say the least. However, it did present an opportunity for us as problem solvers. And we've been able to help so many Ontarians by using our expertise to promote transparency, fairness and accountability more widely across the Ontario public sector. We also helped public servants by either validating their work or providing constructive feedback on how to improve services. In addition, we helped elected representatives serve their constituents by taking referrals and providing assistance. And I am particularly proud of the work that we've done in our two newest areas, children and youth in care and French language services, because it was a team effort involving the entire organization. We published investigative reports this past spring in both areas, leveraging the expertise of our specialized children and youth and French language service units. Je suis très fier du travail. I'm especially proud of the work we've done in our two newest areas, children and youth in care and French language services. Because it was a team effort, we published investigative reports this past spring in both areas, leveraging the expertise of our specialized children and youth and French language services units. French language commissioner Kelly Burke reported on her investigation into Laurentian's University's cuts to French language programs during its financial restructuring. In April, I reported on the sudden closure of two youth justice programs in the North. And in both of these cases, we revealed how a lack of planning and consultation adversely affected the rights of vulnerable people. In both cases, we made recommendations for constructive change. And in both cases, all of our recommendations were accepted. Both of these units have done considerable outreach to the community to ensure that people know what their rights are and how we can help exercise them. They have illustrated how this office can play an important role in protecting citizens' rights and even in reconciliation, which is a goal that we will continue to prioritize in the years to come. 
Ces deux unités ont aussi fait de grands pas vers la communauté pour s'assurer que les personnes this office can play an important role in the protection of rights of citizens and even in regards to reconciliation. Yeah, and the areas that I'm referring to are the areas that we took over when I, when I was appointed to this office in 2016. I'm referring to municipalities, universities, and school boards. The pandemic has clearly been difficult for these bodies, and we've worked with a great many of them, not just to flag complaints, but to identify best practices. These can involve everything from making sure that a virtual municipal meeting is open to the public to ensuring that a university's vaccine policy is fair. Of course, we continue to engage with provincial government agencies and ministries, and we've resolved thousands of individual cases involving everything from birth certificates to family support payments. We work proactively to help people with disabilities renew their health cards online with photo ID and even to help new arrivals from Ukraine cut through red tape to get driver's licenses. And as always, our frontline staff use their expertise in navigating bureaucracy to achieve these results. We stayed on top of long-standing issues as well. In our work, when our recommendations are accepted, we follow up to ensure that they are implemented. For example, we continue to work with senior officials on access to services and supports for adults and children with developmental disabilities. A perennial issue that I talk about is de-escalation training for police in dealing with people in crisis. And the fact is, policing and corrections historically have been the areas in which it is extremely difficult to drive change. Experts and coroners' juries have called for more de-escalation training and a new use of force model for decades. I made these same recommendations in 2016 and they were accepted, but progress has been painfully slow. Still, we continue to work on this issue, and I look forward to discussing it soon with the new Solicitor General, along with the need to improve oversight of vulnerable inmates in segregation. In the coming months, I also look forward to reporting on two important and extremely complex systemic issues and investigations that we've pursued throughout the pandemic. The one relates to delays at the Landlord and Tenant Board, and the other is about oversight of long-term care homes during COVID. As today's report points out, we have resolved individual cases and fixed issues that have affected hundreds of people while these investigations continue. Donc, j'ai hâte de revenir ici plus tard. I look forward to returning later this year to talk to you about these cases in greater depth, but for the moment, I'd be uh, delighted to answer your questions. As those reports, uh, but in the meantime, I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Well, well, um, you boasted the government in 2020 as well on the uh, de-escalation, the lack of de-escalation and your concerns around that. Why do you think it's it's so hard to gain, sorry, gain traction on this? And do you think you face any obstacles trying to present this to a brand new Solicitor General? Well, we'll see. I mean, there has been some progress, but it's it's so slow. And what, what I, th I find a little bit frustrating is that, you know, what I said in 2016 is the time for study and consultation is over. Uh, and um, successive governments have, have seen the need to continue with the consultation. So uh, we're going to keep raising these issues. And, um, you know, if we have to do another investigation, we will. Uh, so it's something that we we're contemplating. Um, but we're definitely going to... Um, maintain our engagement on this issue uh, moving forward so yeah, if you want to do another investigation what might that invest what, would that be a systemic investigation yeah uh, my office has done that in the past um, where after a few years if we don't see enough movement or we think that the uh, progress on the implementation of recommendations is stalled we have the option to do another investigation and shine the light on that issue again and so that's something that uh, is is within our um, within our toolkit if we need to do that on de-escalation. What will yes. determine whether you need to do it or not? Um, several factors. Um, whether we get commitments, uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm looking forward to speaking to a new Solicitor General, asking what's the plan, uh, what are the intentions going forward in the next year or so, and we'll evaluate that. And if we see movement, um, you know, we're happy to work with the uh, Office of the, Mystery, of the Solicitor General, which we do all the time. You know, we have regular meetings uh, and 
bring to their attention issues that we see in corrections and policing. We'll continue to do that, but um, you know, it's a balancing act, and we'll we'll just see where things are in a year or so. Are the police forces unwilling to give um, the escalation training to their officers? Are the officers not willing to to take the training? Where does the problem lie? Like, uh, uh, why are the police so intransigent in this issue? Well, it's a good question. What we're seeing is that, you know, there is de-escalation training and some forces are more advanced than others. What we're calling for is the standardization, making it mandatory and making it standardized so that it doesn't matter, you know, the, the, the level of a response to someone in crisis is not going to vary from Toronto to Windsor to Ottawa. Uh, that's what we're calling for is the standardization of those, uh, of those techniques. Uh, Monsieur Dubé, uh, je sais que le rapport de... de... I know that the... Uh... Commissioner, Commissioner Burke's report uh, has been submitted, but I believe you had comments to say to ha about the report regarding the uh, about Laurentian University and its uh, non-respect of the French Language Services Act, and uh, that they were they behaved uh, inappropriately. I'm very proud of the work done by the French Language Services Commissioner, and I think that really shows our ability to deal with systemic questions and to react quickly. I think we put out the report uh, in six months with uh, specific recommendations. And I think there's something that Commissioner Burke always says, is that you need to plan. Planning is so important in all areas. And, and she really shone, shone a light on the lack of planning in the restructuring pr process at Laurentian and the program cuts that were made. And that's just part of her commitment to the Francophone community. So, so how did you respond to the report? How did you react to the findings? The, you, it, the administration was not aware of the French Language Services Act. It did not respect the French Language Services Act and the government was involved in this violation, well, that's a central part. That's a key part of the work of the commissioner and the commissioner seeks to convince ministries that they need to be more vigilant with changes to the French Language Services Act. Ministers are actually accountable. And I think that's a progress. You guys received a lot of complaints about that. Yeah. What are they mostly saying? You know, we're, we're hearing some really horrible tales of hardship um, in these cases. Um, you know, some people facing eviction that could result in homelessness. And on the landlord's side, uh, some of them are facing financial ruin because, you know, they're, they're lacking revenue. Um, so these delays, I mean, what, what they're what they're being deprived of is access to justice in many cases, right? The, the system is bogging down, they're not getting answers, they're not getting hearings, they're not getting answers. Um, in several cases, and we highlight this in the report, we are able to help break some log jams. We are uh, very successful in some cases of getting matters resolved, getting hearings, getting decisions, um, but those are one-off cases, so that systemic change has to um, really take hold and we're very anxious to come forward with some recommendations uh, in the fall. When will that come out? Well, in a few months, we're in the final, final stages of, of writing that report. So uh, I'm hoping, you know, in, in the coming months. Is the lack of justice weighted towards tenants or landlords? I think there's hardship on both sides. I really do. I, my sense is, is that it's, it's, it's pretty equally painful for, for landlords uh, and, and tenants. And, you know, the complaints that I've seen, um, you know, landlords out tens of thousands of dollars it was an investment for them it was uh, you know part of their livelihood and they're being deprived of that and on the other side of the coin um, vulnerable people who are facing homelessness um, because they can't get their issues uh, addressed um, by you know by the arbitrators so it's um, I, I say there's hardship on both sides but on the landlord tenant board issue uh, the report highlighted that a lot of tenants weren't even able to access hearings because they didn't have the technology, because it, hearings switched to online. And if they don't attend the hearings, they lose the, the, the case and then they're evicted from their units. So shouldn't tenants have, you know, some type of protections from the government in terms of, because they're, they're being evicted from their units. Landlords, yes, they're losing money, but tenants, that, that's pretty much the end of their life, though, isn't it not? 
Well, it's certainly a hardship, but what I've, my understanding is that there have been some adjustments. Uh, in the early days, there was a big push to go virtual and that uh, there were some um, accommodations made and there were more in-person hearings uh, offered to, to accommodate, accommodate those people that could not access uh, hearings virtually. So I think, you know, the, the, the board has been responsive and there there there's been some considerable efforts made but uh, they have a long way to go and the, the glitches still happen are still happening what explains the fact that you've received so many complaints uh, regarding the landlord and tenant board are there some systemic problems at the at the LTB well the restructuring there is underway technology doesn't always work as one would wish. As uh, the uh, I said in my previous response, if people don't have access to technology, it's very difficult for them to attend virtual meetings, online meetings and hearings. Uh, the, the tribunal itself has recognized this, but a lot of work still has to be done. I know, I know the will exists, but this takes time and things aren't moving very quickly. Uh, and we're, we're really eager to, uh, to uh, issue our recommendations is is it does this system work better for landlords or for tenants no i think there's pain on both sides we heard uh we've received complaints from both sides as it were from landlords and from tenants what you found in the covid 19 situation with nursing homes not, no, I can't give you a preview because the investigation is not completed yet what i'll what i'll say is that we are aiming to our focus will be slightly different and, and not repeat what the Auditor General and the patient ombudsman has done. Um, you know, we've got a, a very particular focus and of course our our oversight is over the two ministries. We didn't have a direct line of sight into the long-term care homes like the patient ombudsman does. So our focus will be um, on, the, on, the, on the two ministries and their oversight of the sector. Could you go through those two ministries, what, what you're looking at? Well, we're just looking at how the ministries uh, of health and long-term care, how they responded to the pandemic and what plans and, and how they how, how well they planned for, for COVID in terms of protecting patients, equipping uh, staff and um, how they rolled things out. I'd like to hear you say a few words in English. You talked about uh, de-escalation training for police forces. Could you just say a few words about that in French? Yes, of course. So what we noted in 2016 was that that force training was outdated when it comes to the use of force and it was all about uh, uh, asserting authority when dealing with individuals. So, so police are trained to raise their voice and if the person keeps uh, moving forward or, or even, uh, they, sh they can even fire on them. But this is appropriate for someone in good mental health, but for vulnerable or people who aren't in a good state of mental health, this just doesn't work. And we looked at similar recommendations from uh, commissions of inquiry. And what we say is that there has to be a new model for training, and this training should be standardized across the length and breadth of the province. It really is important that this training should be standard. Unfortunately, it's not the case as we speak today. And, and the services that police forces provide can be different from Toronto to Windsor to Brampton. It really depends on the police force. And so I think it's really in the interest of all Ontarians that these training, this training and that these techniques be standardized across the province. So in relation to complaints on French language services, uh, have there been an increase in the number of complaints? Yes, there has been a number of complaints. And I think we've really built a wonderful team. The commissioner is committed, involved. She's done a lot of awareness raising. I think really the one of the first things we have to do is to tr raise awareness, educate people about their rights, inform them about their rights, and so that they can really claim these rights, enjoy these rights, whether it's the ombudsman or the commissioner, uh, French language services commissioner, there's awareness raising is always an important part of our work. And in that regard, I would say that 
one of our important, one of our key messages is that we've heard wrong information about our mandate. Often you hear people say, well, the commissioner needs complaints in order to investigate. That's not true. The, whether it's the French language service commissioner or the ombudsman, we have the power to take, uh, to undertake, to initiate investigations on our own without complaints. I mean, I feel like we've heard about these awful things that happened during the pandemic. Is there anything different that your office heard? Well, I'm not, you know, I'm not in a position to talk about what we've heard during the investigation. Um, all I can tell you is that we've done a very thorough investigation. We've interviewed almost 100 people. We've reviewed millions of documents. Uh, the disclosure on this one was massive. Uh, and the team has worked tremendously hard. They were the first people to start coming back into the office because there was so much to, to deal with and, and so much, such a great volume of, of materials to go through that uh, doing that virtually was a real challenge. And I have to say that with the long-term care and the um, landlord and tenant board, that's one of the reasons for the delay. That's why it's taken so long. It's because we were working uh, remotely and we weren't the only ones working remotely. The people that we were dealing with, the people that we wanted to interview, the people that we were requesting documents from they were working remotely too so uh, it's it's slowed us down but um, I think that uh, uh, you know we're doing a deep dive into this and we'll have some very substantial recommendations when it's done okay, and you talked about the timing of when the landlord and tenant board investigation will be released what about for this one same thing I mean we're hoping we're hoping in the fall hoping you know if, if all goes well we're hoping by Christmas so I, I hate to uh, I hate to make promises, but we're we're really working on it, and we're we're we're, we're in the final steps of of, of the reports. So. You talked about your broadened mandate. Do you have sufficient resources to deal with all the complaints? To do a, a real deep dive into all these uh, complaints and issues. The uh, internal board accept uh, listen to us has accepted our requests and so yes uh, the board of internal economy has indeed given us the resources that we need to do our work one difficulty we faced during the pandemic is to is in hiring we've hired a lot of people but we're not at full capacity yet so we're still hiring so uh, the uh, Manpower shortage is affecting you as well. Yes, absolutely. Met with both the Ministry of Colleges and Universities, but also with post-secondary schools as well. Um, and the report noted that uh, post-secondary schools should be looking at changing the way that they, in terms of communicating those vaccine mandates and just also their policies around vaccine mandates. A lot of the recommendations, though, is already a lot of university policies, such as explaining why a person might be exempt, uh, providing clear information about you know what circumstances and med about like medical reasons as to why they might be exempt or not so i'm just wondering you know the the only thing that really struck out was just the the part where a lot of students were barred from actually studying at post-secondary schools but it wasn't clear as to going forward if they have to impose mandates again whether or not the ombudsman office is recommending they be barred from studying at universities or not be barred from studying from universities for not taking a vaccine. Yeah, we we don't dic you know we don't dictate policies. Um, you know, s school boards, uh, elected pol officials, they're elected to make policy decisions, and so you know we don't tell them what those policy decisions should be. But once they come up with a policy, our role is to see is to determine whether it works fairly and as it should. So we promote fairness. So in the case of you know. A school board or university coming up with a, a vaccine policy what we look to do is ensure that it's fair and fairness means uh, being adequately communicated to people making sure that they understand it um, hearing their situations and having an accommodation where necessary um, for people for example that can't get vaccinated for medical reasons so that's what we look at is, is the fairness of the policy and whether it's being applied uh, as it should be their whole a slew of issues and concerns in here. Overall, is there something that stands out? Like, you know, what this past year was? 
Well, it, it's look, it's been so challenging. I think of the, you know, all of the the 444, for example, 444 municipalities that had to switch to virtual meetings and having problems with the technology. And you know, meetings are supposed to be done in the open, uh, and uh, some municipalities don't, you know, necessarily have all the resources, and it's it's challenging. And there there are glitches. Everybody's had to pivot, and it's, there's, there's just been a lot of strain, a lot of strain on a lot of organizations uh, across around the world, but definitely across the province. But if there's one theme that we keep coming back to year in and year out, it's communication, and you cannot communicate uh, too much. <laughs> and so sometimes if you're making a change and you're facing difficulties, uh, th then communicate that to the public, communicate that to citizens, and, and let them know where you're at and where things are at. Um, so that's that's something that we are reinforcing uh, perennially is communication. Why do you think you had so many more complaints? You know, it's 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 always a tough question. What you can't read too much into complaints because if complaints go up, it can mean things are bad, or it can mean people have more faith in the system and they're encouraged and they they think that it's worth engaging. So it's a sign of confidence. The same thing if, if complaints go down, it could mean things are better, or it can mean people have given up and they don't bother to complain because they don't see the value. So it's really hard to read too much into complaints. What I'm encouraged about overall is the more complaints we get, the more com people we can help. And I think that's one of the messages that we're trying to get across today is the complaints are up, they're back to, to almost pre-pandemic levels. That means we're engaging with more Ontarians. Again, uh, we're bringing assistance, we're, we're you know, raising their issues with, with governments at the, at the municipal and provincial levels, and we're getting results. You know, we're getting, we're getting really good results. Uh, and even with the challenges that we've faced, you know, this, this incredible team I have, they've, they've maintained the, the service standards, you know, 52% uh, of cases resolved within two weeks out of 25,000 cases. That's really significant. Uh, and so as, as tough as it's been, we've pulled together and we've, we've done, a, I think, a really good job of serving Ontarians. Mr. Kirk, phone line. Ladies and gentlemen on the phone, as a reminder, if you have any questions, please press star 1. There are no questions on the phone. Well, thank you, everybody. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. And we'll see you again soon.